Okay, good morning. Happy Friday. Yes. Okay, so I pulled up the uh, course calendar here. Um, I want to draw your attention to that big red square. Um, exam one is coming up next Thursday. Uh, it'll cover lessons one through eight. It'll cover up to what we are doing today in class. Next Monday, we'll cover one more lesson, lesson nine, but that will not be on exam one. Okay, so again, exam one covers to up to what we're doing in class today. And look at next week, Wednesday, we'll be doing a little bit of review in class. And then Thursday, in your recitation, there's uh, more exam review for any last minute question. And I'll talk more about the exam next week, okay? So today we're going to look at two sections at the same time, 6.4 and 6.5. We're going to do some application of integration related to work work in the physics kind of sense, thing. and uh, also find out how we can calculate the average value of any given function. First of all, if force is a constant quantity, then to calculate work, think of it in terms of energy expended to move something. So if you have a constant force, then you simply multiply force together with the distance moved. Okay, that's if the force is constant. For example, let's say you have an object that has a mass of five kilograms. And when I move it from the ground to uh, a height of two meters, All right, for such a short height here, gravity is considered to be constant. Gravity in reality, of course, is not a constant force. But if the distance is very short, gravity is practically constant. So the work for this kind of situation here, called a W, is the force acting on the object. In this case, it's simply gravity. We're working against gravity. Think of you climbing the stairs from this floor to the upper floor. You're working against gravity. So this thing weighs five kilograms. We know gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, roughly. Right? So that's the force acting on this object. And this object moved a distance of two meters. Force, distance. You multiply this together, we get nine, 98. All right, and look at the units here. This is kilogram meter square per second squared. And that unit is also called joules. It's a measure of energy, and typically abbreviated with just a capital J. Okay, so things are so simple if the force is constant. Now we're going to look at what happens when the force is not constant. Suppose I want to move an object on the floor, let's say. Call that A here. Call that B. 
and I have an object here, and I want to move it. And this time the force is not constant, but the force somehow is, the, is related to the distance that I have moved. So it's a function of x. Okay, so that force is constantly moving. But what we can do here is to use the same principle here. We know gravity is not constant, but in short intervals, we can consider that force as constant. We'll do the same thing here. We're going to divide this into a bunch of short intervals, x2, x3, x4, and so on. And we're going to say that in short intervals, force is roughly constant. So what I can do is to pretend force is constant here, calculate the work for the short segment, do the same thing for the short segment, again, 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 and then add them together. So work is going to be roughly equal to the force evaluated at x1 times delta x plus force evaluated at x2 delta x. So this is the first work segment, second work segment, then the third work segment, and all the way until the end. Right? So that's going to give me some kind of approximation of the work that's required. And of course, we're not happy with approximations. We want the exact answers. And how do you make this exact? We take a limit, right. We take a limit. We let L delta x shrink to zero, and we let n go to infinity, right? We've done this before. That's the same way we calculate the area under a curve. We take a limit on this approximation. So what we have here, let's write work, is approximately equal to, I'm going to use the, um, sigma notation here. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'll write this down first and then I'll explain what it means. That's scratched out. So how many people have seen sigma notation? Okay, most of you. So this means we're adding up stuff. All this is saying is that we're starting at i is equal to 1. So that's f of x1, delta x. Then we move up to i equal to 2. And then we repeat until we move up to i is equal to n. And we'll see a lot more of this later in the course, uh, the sigma notation. So all that saying is adding a bunch of stuff. We want the exact work, so we take the limit as n goes to infinity, we let this n go to infinity. So now we're adding up an infinitely many terms, right? So what does that turn into? We've seen this before. An integration, right. This turns into an integration. Again, it starts at where we wanted to start. We're starting our movement at x is equal to a, ending at x is equal to b. So that turns into an a to b, whatever the force is. And d delta x turns into dx when we do the limit. Okay, so that's how we calculate the work for a non-constant force.
And also, this is exactly the same way we calculate area under a curve, right? So this is all this is saying is that if I can graph my force function, then the work is equal to the area under the force curve. Oh, no, it's not. You're saying that, can we do, do this? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's identical, exactly the same thing, yeah. And in fact, we're going to, usually we write this out, but I wanted to make the limit process ex explicit here. Good, good question. Okay, let's look at a few examples of things that we would encounter in applications where force is not constant, but we're still looking for some kind of work. So if we take a spring, If I just leave the spring sitting there, no force whatsoever on the spring, the length of that spring is called a natural length. So this is the length without any force. Now we all know if you leave the spring there, it's not, there's no force on it, Obviously, it's not doing any work. But as soon as you stretch it or compress it, the spring is going to fight back. If you stretch it, the spring wants to restore to the natural length. If you compress it, it wants to push back out, go back to the natural length. And that means the force is involved, and therefore work is involved. So if I stretch it like this, and let's say this segment here is the natural. And we'll call the extra part here X. So that's how much you have stretched beyond the, the natural length or if you compress it, how much you have taken away from the natural um, length. The force that the spring is going to, to have is equal to a constant, K. This is called a spring constant times X. And x is by how much you have changed the length from the natural length. As you can see, that's a function of x, right? And then the work, this is a non-constant force. We know how to, how to calculate the work now. We integrate from the original length to the final length of the spring. And the important thing here is to, when you measure A and B, you don't want to count the natural length because the natural length provides no force and therefore no work. But any change from that is where work and force, force and work come into play. So that's all we need to do.
spring constant, this is a, uh, a material property or age, for example. A very high K means a very stiff spring, a low K means a soft spring. Question? We'll do an example right now and you'll see how it works. All right, so here's the first example. The spring here has a natural length of 10 inches. force of 10 pounds is required to stretch it to um, 16 inches. We like to find out how much work Need, needed to stretch the spring, spring from its natural length to uh, a length of twenty two inches. Here, we have to be careful you, with units here. So let's say, suppose that I want the answer expressed in foot-pound. That's the uh, English unit for work. OK, so you look at what you want, want to do here. The first thing we need to do, therefore, is to make sure these inches go into foot, right? We have to do that. And there's another one here. So 10 inches is equal to 10 over 12 foot. We can reduce the fraction, but it really doesn't matter that much. 16 inches is equal to 16 over 12 foot. And 22 is 22 over 10, 12, 12, 12 feet, yep. So when you do your work, homework in web assign, make sure you get things in the right units, okay? On the exam, we're not gonna trick you with units, but just trust all the numbers work out. We are nice people. Um, okay, so let's find out what we can do here. The key here is to find out what the spring constant is. In the last page, you saw that we, the force depends on the spring constant. Nowhere in this problem do I see a spring constant. But if I look at the first, the second sentence here, this tells me a little bit about the spring constant, at least indirectly. We know the spring has a force that's described by F is equal to spring constant times X, right? So here I'm told that a force of 10 pounds is needed to stretch the spring from a natural length of 10 to a 16. Remember that X
does not include the natural length. Spring at its natural length doesn't do any work. There's no force. So x over here should be 1. So what x should I put down here? 6 inches, but units, we're going to go into feet, right? So 6 inches, but it's half a foot. Six inches is one half of a foot. That's what this is saying. We're going from 10 to 16. I stretched half a foot. Now, this tells me very clearly that k is equal to 20. So this, this spring has a spring constant of 20. Now we calculate work. the starting length of the spring. So if you look at the statement again, how much work is needed to stretch the spring from its natural length to a length of 22 inches? So we're starting at 10, but we have to take away the natural length when we do the work. So A should be 0. Is that clear why A is zero? Good. You always have to take out the natural. What about B? What should I put down here for B? Twelve? One. Why one? It's twenty two inches subtracting ten inches which is 12 inches, but that's one foot, right? We're doing things in feet. Force, I found out earlier, is 20 times x. That's my k. That's my part of the spring force. All right, now we do this. And we get a 10. And the uh, unit in English units is a foot pound. OK, so spring is pretty easy to handle. You, the key thing, like I said, is to remember you always subtract away the natural length when you calculate A and B, and also the force. Keep in mind that spring, just sitting there with no change from the natural length, has no force, and therefore does no work. Here's another application of, um, of work. Now, for example, if you have a tank full of water and you want to pump all of that water out over the top, Obviously, you need some kind of motor, and how much, and you're going to put in some amount of energy. It could be electricity, it could be gasoline, but you need to provide energy. How much energy do we need to provide so that we can accomplish the task? That's what work is going to tell us. So here, Imagine we have a tank that looks like this. So almost like a, a gutter, right? 
but it's triangular. But same idea. Um, let's say that the triangular cross section has a height of three meters. And this thing is eight meters long. The triangle has a path of three meters also. The thing right now is full of water, entirely full of water. find the work required to pump all the water out of this tank over one of the edges at the top. Okay, so we're not going to worry about the actual mechanism. How do we do that? What kind of motor? What, is there a spout somewhere? We're not going to worry about that. We're going to assume that we can magically move the water out, but we have to pay in terms of work. And that's what we want to calculate. And we're going to use the principle very much like how we did volume. When we did volumes, we calculated volume of one disk or one cylinder, and then let integration take care of the rest. We'll do exactly the same kind of thing here. We're going to calculate the work to move one arbitrary slice of water. Of course, in reality, we can't slice water. We can't move a slice of water. But mathematically, we can do that. And it's a way to model the process, and it actually gives us the right answer. Then we integrate. Okay, so the process is a little bit complicated when you first look at it. So let me show you how this works. Let's take this triangle, the front side of the triangle here. Let me blow it up just a little bit more, or a lot more. I'm going to say x is equal to 0 at the bottom of the tank. And because we know this thing is three meters tall, x is equal to three at the very top of the tank. And let me chop this triangle in two here. If you look at this here, this entire distance is three meters. If I cut it in two, this is three over two meters. Now imagine we have one slice of water. Somehow I can freeze time, I can freeze water, and I take a very thin slice of that, like that. Then I'm going to calculate the work. I need to find out the force acting on that, and I need to find out how much distance it has to go over the top. And once I can find out one of them, I'll let integration do the rest. Let me call half of the, the width of this slice. of the slice of water. <coughs> and 
and then we calculate the work for that one slice. And by the way, as usual, we'll say this slice has a thickness of dx, a tiny little increment in x. So what does that one slice look like? What, what shape is it? It's a rectangle, good. The width is twice of that quantity I called S. And then, how long is this thing? Eight? Eight meters? And then, of course, it's got a thickness of dx. What's the force acting upon that slice? What is it fighting against? Gravity, good. In other words, it's the, the weight of that slice of water, right? How would you calculate the weight of that rectangular slab? Excellent. Volume times density. Well, actually, one step short. That gives me mass, right? How do I make a weight? Times gravity. Excellent. This gives me mass, and that's multiplying by gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Then that mass becomes weight. All right, so let's see. The volume, 2s times 8 times dx. Anyone know the density of water? It's 1,000 um, kilogram per meters cubed. Okay, on the exam, we'll give that to you, okay? What about gravity? We saw that earlier, 9.8, right? That's meters per second square. So all the units work out in this problem. Everything is in kilogram, everything's in meters, everything's in seconds. So if you multiply all of this together, um, what do we get? 2 times 8 times 9.8 times 1,000. Times that quantity S, that's half the width of the slab. Okay, now we got a problem here. I got weight in terms of this S here. S is half, half width of the slab. But I would really, really like to relate that to X. X is the, in the vertical distance that's related to what I'm moving, where I'm moving, and how much I'm moving. So we have to rewrite that. Of, so we have X in the equation and not that quantity S.
Okay, so any idea how we can do that? There are a couple of different ways. What do you think? Right, yep, the key word that he said here is similar triangle. So let's take a look at that. Excellent. So in the cross section here, remember this big long distance is 3. And this shorter one here is x. It's measured from the bottom of the tank to the surface of the water. And this was 3 over 2. And this is s. So notice what happens here is we have two triangles that have exactly the same three angles and the same proportion. We call these similar triangles. How many people have heard of similar triangles before? Good. Okay, so what are the properties of similar triangles that can help us here? Ratio. Excellent. The ratio of the sides, right? So you can see if we take 3 over 2 over 3, must be equal to S over X. which means S is equal to 1 half times X. Right? 3 over 2 over 3 is 1 half, and I multiply the X over here, and this accomplishes what I wanted to do. I don't want my little S in there. It helped me in visualizing and calculating the slice weight, but really, I needed everything in terms of X. Any question with this step here? Yes. Oh, dx. Where did dx go? It's still there. I just left it out. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Other questions? All right, so then back to the previous page. We had, uh, what was that number? 156,800S times dx. And that's now going to be 78,400X times dx. Okay, so that's one, that's, the, that's the, the weight that we need to, the weight of a slice at some arbitrary height. So how far does it have to travel to reach the top? Good. It's at a height of x. It needs to go to 3, so it's got 3 minus x left. Okay, three is the goal. This is how much this slice already has moved. So the work of one slice is equal to this. This 
this thing times the distance it has to move. Then the work of the entire tank, now we gotta add up all of these infinitely many slices. We integrate that thing. And what are my integration limits? Very good, zero to three. I start grabbing my slices at, at the bottom and I keep doing that until three. Right, the tank was full, right? So I start with the slice at the bottom, move up, move up, move up, move up, move up until the very top. Of course, the very top, the slice at the very top is almost there already. It doesn't need much work to get there, but the, the one at the bottom needs a lot of work to, to reach the top. Okay? Okay, that's an easy integral to integrate, so I'm gonna leave that uh, for you to do, but the setup is the focus I wanted to, is the thing I wanted to focus on. This, I'll let you integrate on your own. Questions on this? Yeah. Three minus X? X was part of the, uh, the weight. See, 78, X times the distance. This was part of the work, the weight. The weight includes x, the weight was a function of s, remember? And then we did a tri similar triangle and we showed that s is one half x. Four, that's right, weight, work is force times distance. Work is, so it's my weight times how much it has to go. Okay, next we're gonna look at how we can calculate the average of something. So I'm gonna use the concept that we already know, calculating the average of a bunch of numbers. So let's say I have five numbers. 10, 12, 9, 17, 5. So these might be the quiz scores of some five students I chose at random. No, it's not. Just five numbers I made up. How would you calculate the average of this? Yep. So it's 10 plus 12 plus 9 plus 17 plus 5 over 5, right? And this is 10.6. So that's total divided by the number. Notice what happens then if I take my 10.6 and I multiply by five. Okay, I get the same sum as if everybody got 10.6. That's what average means. Okay, so this concept, we're gonna extend this a little bit for a function. So 
for example, if I have, this could be the temperature in West Lafayette throughout the day. I would like to know the average temperature on that day. It's a it's continuous function. How would I find that? I'm going to use exactly the same principle here. But instead of total, the sum of five numbers and when you say a sum of fu one function, that doesn't make sense. We're going to change the word total to area, right? Because that's kind of a sum of this entire thing underneath the function. And obviously, we can't count how many numbers are between A and B. There's an infinitely many of them. So we're going to count how big a difference there is between A and B. Then the average is calculated exactly the same way. So the average of a function is total, which becomes area, which is an integral a to b, f of x dx, divided by the difference between a and b, and that's b minus a. Or more often, you'll see it written this way. And an interesting property we can see from this equation, if I multiply both sides by b minus a, And what this equation is saying is that the area under this curve is equal to the average value of the function times b minus a. Geometrically, The left side is a rectangle, right? The right side is just the area under the curve. So the meaning of average is still the same. If five students got those five scores, the average means if I replace everybody's score with that same number, I get the same total. Here is if I replace the entire curve, with a flat straight line, I get the same area underneath. Exactly the same meaning, and we just had to extend a little bit to make it work. Okay, that's it for today. Have a good weekend. See you Monday.